I would like to invite the panel members to come here uh, for the Q&A section. Um, yeah, for, 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 for um, if you have any question from Nela, uh, please just raise because we're going to kind of take it down and we will uh, forward it to her and she could get back to you. Um, okay, uh, shall we have the first round of questions? Maybe we collect five or six questions at a time. Uh, yes. Testing. Uh, please introduce your name and uh, where you're from, and uh, you know, please make the questions short and, and uh, who you want to address the question to. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Mike Jones. I'm based at the Swedish Biodiversity Centre. I'm also chair of the IUCN's Resilience Task Force, so this session has been particularly interesting to me. I, I actually have many questions, but I'll confine myself to one, and that's aimed at Magnus. And that's to ask him to what extent has he considered history and the history of responses to climate change, the consequences of climate change to societies in Europe um, over the last couple of thousand years. My understanding is that a climate change of less than one degree actually can have very profound effects. So it's not just about the interaction between Europe and other uh, climate change sensitive parts of the world, I think it's also about what it's going to do here in Europe. People who think that we can manage, can cope with, adapt to two degrees of change, I think they're dreaming unless they start to take the lessons of history into account. So my question is, to what extent are you doing that <clears throat> and feeding it into uh, climate change policy? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Holger Hoff is my name with the Stockholm Institute here. My question also goes to Magnus. It's half of it is a comment just to understand you right. You're not focusing on developed countries only. You're also um, addressing increased vulnerability in developing countries, I suppose, because they are also um, more and more um, dependent, some of them on imports, for example. And the second is the question whether you address some um, atmospheric teleconnections, as we are exploring with our colleagues at SRC, which either through climate change or land use change in other regions may very strongly affect the situation in distant regions um, via um, changes in precipitation and other long-range effects that may be caused in quite different regions. Thank you. My name is Åse Johannesen. I'm at the Stockholm Centre. Um, and my question goes to Frank Tumala. Uh, and your, you have uh, given me the same question, so I'll just give you this question back. The, the choice of countries <laughs> that you have in your... Uh, the basis for that and, and taking consideration to if SCI is going to uh, um, focus on, how do you say, where the issue is critical, uh, just coming back from the Philippines yesterday, uh, the women there are very empowered and, and maybe looking at how do you choose countries based on maybe gender inequality and dif difficulty in uh, working in uh, sectors like DRR, like for example Pakistan and India, maybe where the issue is much more critical and a women's struggle. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Bo Chilean, uh, SCI Associate Stockholm. I also wanted to ask uh, Magnus, I think that it's very interesting with these categories that you mentioned, for biophysical, trade, uh, financial, uh, human, etc. I was just wondering uh, two things. First, do, will you make any distinction between uh, climate disasters and uh, uh, more long-term climate change in operating this. The other question is really that human uh, covers so many, uh, or people as you said, covers so many different categories of, of problems. It can be health, it can be political impacts, and I wonder if you could comment a little more about this. 
Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, Sorry, Arnold. Yeah. <laughs> you just want to talk. Yeah, one more. Thank you. Yes, hello. I'm Jöran Nilsson Axberg, also SCI Associates, Stockholm. <laughs> to Frank, to Mala. Um, this index, this work on gender in disaster risk reduction. I'm thinking about timing. Early, earlier we heard from, from the work on clean air and how it come into international processes just on time after 15 or maybe 25 years of research and work. You seem to be starting now and we are talking about post 2015. How, what are your entry points to policy impacts in this short time? perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe our panel can address the question. Um, maybe I'll jump in first then, cross over. Um, question on history is a very interesting one. And um, within this set of projects, I'd say we're not specifically aiming to do that, but there's two things that come up. One is the general scenarios work that SCI does. And we've mentioned there the discussion about learning from historians developing future scenarios with historians to gain perspectives on past change as something we'd like to do. So we're definitely thinking that way. And the other is, um, I think your question was partly about the limits to adaptation, which is a, there's quite a few gaps in the research there. And that's something that, again, SEI um, would like to focus on more. What are the limits to adaptation? And then again, within that work, then you could look back um, to look at previous limits and how they are after often a lot lower than um, assessments of adaptive capacity and vulnerability tend to show. Um, so not within this line of work, but very much get the point. And then um, Holger, yes. Yeah, so in terms of the, the index itself, that would be something global. And indirect impacts are important for all countries, not just rich ones. Yeah. So there's a, a policy message there that is relevant to richer countries, but indirect impacts are, should be part of adaptation and planning in all countries. And some emerging economies or, or low-income countries are extremely trade-dependent, for example, for food security or for other resources. So these issues were no less important there. And one of the case studies we'd like to focus on is actually about food security in Senegal, for example. And I'll say something more about that tomorrow, I think. Um, and quickly, Bo, on... Uh, Extreme versus long term. So again, within the idea of this index, then it will be quite crude and it won't necessarily distinguish between the difference. It will look more generically at exposure to risks through the pathways, even though those risks are different if they're about extreme events or if they're about long term changes. So I think in our conceptual work on indirect impacts, then we, we distinguish between the two, but the index itself might not get that level of subtlety. And then the people pathway, I mean, we will concentrate our research, having set out this conceptual framework, maybe more on the overall global context and, and on the trade pathways, partly because they're the least researched, I'd say. So on the people side, human health, there's quite a good amount of research on the impacts of climate change on human health. And the migration story is a very complex one. There's a lot of disagreement in the literature on the extent to which climate is a driver of of migration, under what circumstances, what kinds of migration. So we're choosing not to venture too much into that field within our project in the short term, but to sort of note that there is a discussion there, but that clearly, especially over the longer term and under higher end scenarios, um, the movement of people across borders is, is going to be an issue of some sort. Pass it to you. Thanks. Osa and Joran for your questions. Um, I think um, they're not that easy to answer, but um, as usual, it's, it's a combination of things. And I don't remember asking you that question. <laughs> but thank you for getting me back on that one. Um, I think in terms of the choice of countries, it's a combination of selecting countries that um, have a high level 
of poverty and low development um, and that are highly vulnerable, that have been identified to be highly vul vulnerable to climate change um, and that have experienced um, a high frequency of disasters um, with, with high impacts. Um, they are also, the selection is also based, to, based on some, some preferences. Um, UNDP have, have had um, not just those countries, there have been some other countries we've discussed. Um, we did not discuss the, the countries that you mentioned. Um, that's probably partially because of um, our own inexperience in, in working in some of those countries um, and the strategic decision to focus on Southeast Asia rather than South Asia, even though there's um, been a lot of discussions on um, our opportunities and, and our capacities um, to work in those countries. And I agree with you that clearly some of those countries are even more vulnerable and that gender equality is even greater. Um, and it's, um, it's partially because of our own capacities um, and our own opportunities. Um, I've only just recently rejoined SEI 10 months ago, so this is one of the opportunities that, that I've identified. Um, and we've also created um, uh, a lot of uh, human capacity in our Asia Center um, in terms of looking at gender and hazards and gender and climate change. Um, so I hope that goes some way towards um, answering your question. Joran, um, in terms of timing and entry points, um, again, SEI capacity and opportunity plays a great role there. Um, in some aspects, we're coming to this quite late. There's been quite a lot of work on this, and this is going to be one of the challenges, I think, overall with our new initiative on disaster resilience, because it is a very crowded field. There are a lot of players out there, and we have quite a lot of experience in vulnerability and uh, resilience research, climate change, adaptation, um, and some other related areas of work. But this is the first time we're trying to bring it all together um, and building on, just saw Roger Kasperson in the audience there. Hi, Roger. Building on our work a few years ago on, of the um, Vulnerability, poverty and vulnerability program and the um, risk livelihoods and vulnerability program. So sort of with some of the stuff we're going full circle now, which is nice to see. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities in the policy arena to influence what's going to happen with the post-2015 HFA, even though it is just sort of literally around the corner. But, um, but there are a lot of um, policy platforms, dialogues, and things like that happening, um, at least in, in Southeast Asia at the moment, that when we can hook into and that we are hoping to have an in influence on. And the final thing that I haven't mentioned in my presentation, which I forgot, um, is that I think one of the really great opportunities for us right now with the UNDP is that they've just, they're just about to launch their new strategic plan um, for 2014 to 2017. Which builds, which focuses on regional cooperation, um, of course, poverty reduction, gender equality, and building resilience to disasters. And UNDP in Asia see SEI as a key partner in the region. So I think that's our opportunity. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we have the second round of question. Uh, actually, we only have. We don't have much time because we need to answer the question. So maybe, you know, two more questions. <laughs> yeah, two more questions. Very short question. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, it's uh, Arnold Rosemarin at uh, SCI Stockholm. <clears throat> A bit of an appetizer before lunch uh, with respect to intestinal diseases. Uh, and I, I, I missed that uh, message from, I mean, human beings are extremely vulnerable to a few things, and one of them are multi-drug-resistant uh, intestinal bugs, which are going around the world. Ha, uh, I think maybe you, you should maybe tell us a little bit about how critical the situation is in Vietnam. There are people in this audience from Karolinska Institute that are actually working in Vietnam on this question. It will be bigger than AIDS. It would be much, much bigger than any of the intestinal diseases we've had so far. 
because this is multi-drug resistance at many species. And I think uh, you can connect it to poverty, gender, climate change, what have you, peri-urban, urban questions. But it's something I think that um, will bring us together something for SCI. Thank you. Uh, could you kind of make the question you know, short? What, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Uh, no, just to say, uh, if you know something about the work on a multi-drug resistance right. in Vietnam. Right. One more question. Sure, sorry, also for, for Magnus. Um, you mentioned your, your index. Thanks for sharing it, by the way. The idea is, is great. Um, you, you mentioned it sort of as, a, as an awareness raising tool, but um, this is a, a process question. We all know once an index is out there, it's open for all kinds of appropriations and misapplications. And I was just curious if you thought about what types of policy applications it might be used for and whether you can mitigate against any of the wrong uses. And a second question is the, the cocktail glass on one of your slides. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, we cannot collect any uh, 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 question now. If you have any like burning question, uh, you know we still have few days uh, uh, here. So please come to what our member, and you know we could discuss directly. Uh, make that sort of one to. Okay. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the cocktail glass. Uh, I've, I've forgotten about that. Do you know what cocktail it was? It was a cosmopolitan. And the point was it's sort of bringing a more cosmopolitanist flavour to uh, adaptation. Uh, we're all in this together, that sort of thing, so well spotted. Um, in terms of the policy use or the, the way in which to raise awareness, it, part of this is motivated by interviews we've done at COPS and some early work on the case studies. And the idea of indirect impacts is, is quite new to some people, which I, th I find quite a surprise. But... A lot of people need a way of coming into the topic, and people love maps. So it's, it's, it's really quite a simple communication device to start people thinking about why certain rich areas or certain parts of the world that are very trade dependent are coming up as the red areas, not the green, safe, blue areas of the other maps. And in terms of guarding against its misuse, then I guess we just have to be extremely clear about how it was developed and what its limits are. And that's something that you find in the other vulnerability indices, that they're very opaque sometimes in how they arrived at their um, selection of indicators and how they've weighted them or put them together, and they don't do that. So I think it's just a big health warning on the front of, of its limits. Thank you. Uh, the question addressed to me, um, actually, I think, uh, you know, we could discuss outside this, uh, this panel because the time is um, finished and uh, I need also some time to really recollect and, and, and we could uh, share more about what the situation and program in Vietnam. Um, I hope it's okay with you. And um, yeah, thank you very much, panels, for sharing uh, your uh, <laughs>